Well, hello. And today, we'll talk about Richard Crashaw. Crashaw's, you know, they're all fascinating stories, but Crashaw is uh, kind of like the counter to, uh, to Dunn, who went from being a Catholic to being, being an Anglican. Crashaw started out as an Anglican and became a Catholic. Uh, that revolving door <laughs> across the, the confessional lines. Um, it's an interesting story, though. Um, Crashaw was born to uh, a father who was uh, an Anglican divine, but he was one of the, these Anglican divines who was leaning heavily toward the Puritan side, so a heavy Calvinist. And he really hated the Catholic Church. And Crashaw was born in 1612, 1613, no one's exactly sure when he was born. Uh, and he didn't live that long. He made it to about 36. Uh, and m many of these poets didn't live that long. Uh, Herbert made it to 40. Uh, Dunn was an old timer, made it to, into his 50s. Uh, Traherne made it to 37. And, uh, the only, and, uh, Vaughn was the only one that went to, to old age. He made it to uh, in his 70s, I believe. So, to talk about Richard Crashaw. Now, he was raised by this father, and his mother died very young. So, uh, critics is, have often seen in Crashaw's poetry a kind of psychological yearning for a mother. And there's something to that, I think. Uh, his poems are very concerned with, with feminine figures, with Teresa of Avila, with Virgin Mary. Uh, and there's an erotic element that inhabits his poems as well, um, which I think is, you know, to a, a certain degree inspired by the Song of Songs, but also by mystical poetry and its erotic um, language often. Um, so some people kind of treat him as a Baroque figure. The, his, his Baroque art. It was a, a, an important uh, work of criticism of Crashaw. Not a lot of criticism on Crashaw there, unfortunately, in the 60s, talking about how he was this Baroque figure and his uh, poetry is very emotional, like in Baroque art, it's very concentrated on emotions. And again, you know, we could say that's very inspired by the Ignatian exercises with uh, uh, bringing the emotions in to the relationship of the meditation, right? Getting emo emotionally involved with the, with the subject. Now, interesting, though, with, with Crashaw, he, will, he went to Cambridge, uh, and when he was ordained, he was given a parish in Cambridge, Saint, Little St. Mary's, it's called. And I have a picture of it on uh, one, one of the bookends here of the video. And uh, Cambridge is about uh, 30 miles away from Little Gidding. And I don't know exactly how he encountered the, the, the community with the, the Ferrars at Little Gidding, but he became a regular visitor. And he be became very close and very devoted to Mary Collett. And she was one of the, the lead figures in the Little Gidding community. And uh, he thought of her as his mother. You know, and I think what happened though is is the closer he he drew to Catholicism, the more warning flags went off with the with the Ferrars uh, because they were all they were already accused of being too Catholic. There was a pamphlet uh, dismisses of the dismissive of, the, of their uh, community called the the, Ar the Arminian nunnery. Ah. Uh, because they did live a very monastic life, though they were not, they, they didn't, were not under vows. That was their reason of saying that we're not Catholic, we're not under vows. But it was very Catholic in in sense. In fact, I've read about it in a, my book, um, the Incarnation of the Poetic Word. I have a chapter on uh, Robert Herrick and the Gidding, little Gidding community, as palimpsests of. Uh, of Catholicism in 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 post Reformation England, you know, there's, there's still a ghost of Catholicism, of the English English Catholicism there, even though it's not Catholicism. 
which they would be the first to tell you. But I thought what we could do is look at um, some of Crashaw's um, poetry concerned with feminine figures. And the first one I'll look at is actually uh, from a translation he did. Uh, it's a, the name of the poem is a description of a religious house and condition of life. And the reason I want to bring this up is because part of the, the project of early modern English translations, as we talked about with Thomas Wyatt, was to uh, really put your own print, uh, not on the translation, but your own uh, spin on current situations. So here, here's Crashaw doing this translation, but really, in a, in a sense, what he's also talking about is the little, little Gidding community. And here, uh, these, here's the, the last four lines of the poem, which I'd like to share with you. The self-remembering soul sweetly recovers her kindred with the stars, not basely hovers below, but meditates her immortal way, home to the original source of light and intellectual day. And I think, uh, to a degree, that's what uh, what Crashaw found at Little Gidding. You know, and I think it's also what T.S. Eliot found at Little Gidding, too, with his in incredible Anglo-Catholicism articulated in a much different time in uh, the Four Quartets, which I hoped, hoped it, when I do the course on uh, Poets and Mystics, I hoped it, to uh, have one session be on, on Eliot. So we'll see. So here, let's look at the the hymn to to the name and honor of the ad admirable Saint Teresa, foundress of the Reformation of the Discalced Carm Carmelites. Um, important with this is um, what year was it? I don't know what year it was. Oh, in 1623. I'm looking at my cheat sheets. 1623, so this is, you know, crash I was a little kid. Um, Sir Toby Matthew issued a translation of St. Teresa's autobiography, uh, which came out in English, in another one of these clandestine printing projects. And it, was, it found some popularity uh, in Spanish mysticism of this, this time. Ignatius is one, the Carmelite. St. Teresa, as well as uh, St. John of the Cross. They, their uh, new kind of mysticism, quietism to, to a degree, right, uh, was finding its way across the continent. It was, and it was highly suspect even in Catholic circles, you know. St. John of the Cross did some time in prison because of his mysticism. Um, and, but it made a great impact on Richard Crashaw. When he read this book and the poem it's you know it's very unwieldy you know and it can tell with Crashaw he's so emotionally exuberant he's so emotionally into what he's what he's writing about that just the, the cadences of the poetry almost take you want to like to start to fly you know um, but we'll, we'll, we'll start I'll, I'll go up to a, uh, we'll start with line 15, where he's talking about St. Teresa as a little girl in her autobiography. She talks about wanting to go and be a martyr, you know, with the Moors, because she was in Spain, of course. The Moors weren't far away. And uh, certainly the early modern uh, religious poets, especially Crashaw, Dunn, even Herbert, are kind of almost morbidly fascinated with affliction and done and uh, crash out with martyrdom, right? So here, here's what, what, he, what he says. Scarce has she learned to lisp the name of martyr, yet she thinks it shame life should so long play with that breath which spent can buy so brave a death. She never undertook to know what death and with love should have to do. Nor has she, has she ere, ere yet understood why to show love. She should shed blood. Yet though she cannot tell you why, she can love and she can die. Scarce is the blood enough to make a guilty sword blush for her sake. Yet she's a heart dares hope to prove 
how much less strong is death than love? Right? What are you willing... You know, in, in a sense, it reminds me of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his, you know, his saying that, you know, cheap grace. You know, there's, what we need, he says, is more costly grace. We have enough cheap grace. God loves me. You know, what's it, it doesn't cost you anything, right? What's it going to cost you? Your, your faith. And then he goes on, but I won't read. I won't read the whole thing. It's a very long poem, but I want to move to one of the more erotic sections. We could call it, um, starting at line seventy-five. Now he must. I'm guessing. And other critics would guess. You know the famous Bernini uh, um, sculpture of Saint Teresa being uh, thrust with a with an arrow by the angel, right? The flaming dart. And here's what, here's what he says. Thou art love's victim, and must die a death more mystical and high. Into love's arms thou shalt let fall a still surviving funeral. His is the dart, meaning the angel, must make the death whose stroke shall taste thy hallowed breath. A dart thrice dipped in that rich flame, which writes thy spouse's radiant name. Upon the roof of heaven, where I it shines, and with a sovereign ray, beats bright upon the burning faces of souls, which in that name's sweet graces find everlasting smiles. So rare, so spiritual, pure and fair, must be the mortal instrument upon whose choice point shall, shall be sent, a life so loved. And that there be fit executioners for thee, the fairest and firstborn sons of fire, blessed seraphim, shall leave their choir and turn love's soldiers upon thee to exercise their archery. Whew. <laughs> That's pretty. I mean, Freud could have a whole thing with this, couldn't he? Um, it continues. Oh, how oft shalt thou, thou complain of a sweet and subtle pain, of intolerable joys, of a death in which who dies loves his death and dies again for would and would forever so be slain and lives and dies and knows not why to live but that he thus may never leave to die how kindly will thy gentle heart kiss the sweetly killing dart and close in his embraces keep those delicious wounds that weep balsam to heal themselves with I mean, super erotic poetry here. Um, and curious that, that Richard Crashaw, a man, uh, places himself into this imaginative space where he sees, where, where he contemplates this with St. Teresa. So, yeah, it's pretty, I mean, we won't read the whole thing, but it is pretty incredible, his... His, the depth of his uh, eroticism when he comes to St. Teresa. <laughs> and again, and when you go to line 121, it looks like, There, so soon as thou shalt first appear, the moon of maiden stars, thy white mistress, attended by such bright souls as thy shining self, shall come, and in her f first ranks make thee room, where amongst her snowy family and mortal welcomes wait for thee. Talking about the Virgin Mary welcoming in her into this, uh, into her retinue, I guess you could say. You know, very interesting. I mean, you, you can see uh, Dunn, right? We talked about Batter My Heart, Three Person God, really draws uh, on eroticism to express some of his uh, religious, or we can call mystical insights. Same thing with that Crashaw's doing here. But Crashaw, unlike Dunn, has a deeply Marian devotional life. You know, reminds me of a friend of mine who's an Episcopalian priest. He's probably the most Marian, uh, one of the more Marian people I know out there. You know, he has a lady mass every Saturday. So from there, let's look at his other, one of his other uh, Teresa poems, The Flaming Heart, which is upon the book from Saint uh, uh, Sir Toby. 
um, Matthew translated. And this is an, I, I always like some of the lines here. <coughs> Pardon me. So we'll start right from the beginning. Well-meaning readers, you that come as friends and catch the precious name this piece pretends, make not too much haste to admire that fair-cheeked fallacy of fire. Now notice that the cadence, the rhythm here is like exuberant. It's joyful. That is a seraphim, they say, and this the great Theresier. Readers be ruled by me and make here a well-placed and wise mistake. You must transpose the picture quite and spell it wrong to read it right. Read him for her and her for him and call the saint the seraphim. Right? Now, you could... Let's read that again. Readers be, ru readers be ruled by me and make here a well-placed and wise mistake. Yes, I know this is not the right way, but this is how we're going to read it. You must transpose the picture quite, meaning thinking the picture of uh, Renini stabbing the saint with, with his arrow. And, and there's another, he, he uh, Crashaw provides an illustration which is not half as cool as, as Bernini's, but you get the idea. Uh, you must transpose the picture quite and spell it wrong to read it right. Read him for her and her for him and call the saint the seraphim. You know, so he does this, uh, we could call it a gender displacement? What do you call it? Read her for him and him for her. You know, but part of what this is too is he's there's a, a rhetorical figure called a chiasmus, right? So you would say, for instance, the sun will rise and rise will the sun, right? It, it's, so it kind of runs back against against itself, and he's using that not a, not a, a rhetorical chiasmus, but an image, uh, imaginal chiasmus, right here. But also with gender. Now, we talked with Dunn in uh, Death's Duel, how at the end he talks about licking the wounds, you know, this idea of Christ as mother. Well, you know, this, this, this unsexing, we can call it, this transposition, which, which is another, we can say, another kind of translation, a, a moving from one state to another. Um, And, the, and it's <laughs> and Krasha just plays with this. He lets go. I'll, I'll read some, a little bit further on. Painter, what didst thou understand to put her dart into his hand? See, even the years and size of him shows this the mother seraphim. This is the mistress flame, and duty is he. Her happy fireworks here comes down to see. O oh, most poor spirited of men, and thy cold pencil kissed her pen. Thou couldst not so unkindly err to show us this faint sh shade for her. Why, man, this speaks pure mortal frame and mocks the female frost, loves manly flame. I must marks with female frost, loves manly flame. One would suspect thou meanest to paint some weak, inferior woman saint, but had thy pale-faced purple took Fire from the burning cheeks of that bright book, thou wouldst on her have heaped up all that could be found, Seraphical. What air this youth of fire wears fair, rosy fingers, radiant hair, glowing cheeks and glistering wings, all those fair and fragrant things, but before all that fiery dart had filled the hand of his great heart. And I'll just read a little bit more. Do then as equal right, right requires, since his the blushes be and hers the fires. Resume and rectify thy rude design, undress thy seraphim into mine. Redeem this injury of thy art. Give him the veil, give her the dart. <laughs> you could just do a whole psychological thing on this, right? Uh, and this is why people, you can see why, why people in the past have read uh, 
Fred Crashaw is deeply affected by his mother's death. And actually, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of Michelangelo. And uh, you'll notice in Michelangelo's work, very seldom does he paint women. I mean, his... Uh, um, what do they call them? Some of his figures in the Sistine Chapel, um, they... They're not feminine figures. They're actually male figures with feminine faces, if they have that at all. The, the one exception is, uh, of his paintings is uh, like in, or some of those of the Virgin Mary. And some critics have wondered if that's not his remembrance of his own mother, because like Crashaw, Michelangelo lost his mother as a young, young child. Um, but also, if you look at in... Michelangelo's work, also the the Virgin Mary in the, in the Pietà, you know, you have a kind of transposition of relationship between uh, Christ and Mary, because if Mary were to stand up, she'd be eleven feet tall, whereas Christ in the Pietà would be, you know, almost six feet tall or whatever. Um, so, and she becomes the throne, right, the throne of, of God in that in that picture. And that, that sculpture. So, so Crashaw is, at least psychologically, I think, um, working out some things. And, and of course, the, the erotic element, I, I, Crashaw did, did not marry, you know, which inhabits this, these poems on, on St. Teresa, is pretty astounding. Um, And I should say, you know what I meant, I meant to say earlier, when he talks about all these deaths, right? um, for instance, on page, line 82, it looks like, uh, or 80, 81, let this immortal life where it comes walk in a crowd of loves and martyrdoms. Let mystic deaths wait on it, and wise souls be the love-slain witnesses of this life and of thee. O oh, sweet incendiary, Shoe here thy art upon this carcass of a hard, cold heart. Let all thy scattered shafts of light that play among the leaves of thy large books of day combined against this breast at once break in and take away from me myself and sin. This gracious robbery shall thy bounty be. Right. Um, and even before that, he says... <laughs> Live here, great heart, and love, and die, and kill, and bleed, and wound, and yield, and conquer still. Let this immortal life, where it, where'er it comes, walk in the crowd of loves and martyrdoms. Now, what he's, you know, part of what we can, what he's drawing on, is uh, in the early modern period in English, uh, die. The word die was slang for orgasm. So Crashaw's drawing on that here too, right? So it's a totally orgasmic, ecstatic um, religious experience. You know, it's still chaste. It's like 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 Dunn said, oh, oh, and never chased unless unless thou ravish me. So Crashaw's being ravished in a way by Saint Teresa, which is again a kind of chiasmus, right? It goes against type. But why do they do this? Why, why do mystics speak in these kinds of paradoxical languages? Well, to wake us up. To wake us up, to wake themselves up. You know? Because it's startling. And you have to, we have to be shaken from our, our uh, habitual interpretations of things. You know? And so let me just let me finish up with some of this. In my best fortune, such fair spoils of me, O thou undaunted daughter of desires, daughter of desires, by all thy dower of lights and fires, by all the eagle in thee, all the dove, by all the lives and deaths of love, by thy large drafts of intellectual day, and by thy thirsts of love more large than they, by all thy brimful-filled bowels of fierce desires, by thy last morning's draught of liquid fire, by the full kingdom of that final kiss, 
that sees thy parting soul and seal thee his. By all the heavens thou hast in him, fair sister of the seraphim, by all of him we have in thee, leave nothing of myself in thee. Let me so read thy life that I unto all, unto all life of mine may die. Now he uses the anaphora, and anaphora is, goes back to Greek um, rhetoric and uh, poetics, where they start each, each line with, a, with the same words, like, by all thy, by all, by all, by thy, right? When he does this, he's offering it up. That's what anaphora means, the offering. He's offering it up. But if you'll notice that, you know, he's also drawing on the Petrarchan, tradition and in Petrarch um, you know my love is is fiery ice and icy fire you know that kind of that kind of language and he's doing that here but as we saw with uh, with with uh, Suthel he's using this these love conceits for something more worthy of of uh, love conceits in his opinion you know religious verse or our relationship to God. So Song of Songs kind of thing, right? And uh, so pretty startling, pretty startling poem. And, and really, I mean, it really rewards uh, contemplation, you know, to, to spend time with it. And it's hard, I think, uh, for me anyway, to spend uh, contemplative space with... Uh, Richard Crashaw, I shouldn't say hard, it's harder than with Herbert. And I think it's because Herbert, who's kind of calm, you know, we talked about it, you know, he's got the ecstatic version. This is certainly ecstatic poetry, just the opposite of, of uh, Herbert. And so with Herbert, he, he kind of, you know, he's very uh, conducive to a, a, a contemplative reading, whereas the exuberance of Crashaw here, it's hard to settle down when you're reading it. You're like, dang, look, oh, he's getting it's talking about sex now. Right? He's taking off, you know, he's he can't hold back at all. Alright, so let's look at another of his poems. Now, the hard thing with, with Crashaw is there's with, with, with a good number of his poems, right? They come out in two different versions, and it's hard uh for editors, you know, they, they put both versions in, they put one version in, and they've been, Crashaw is not as popular as Herbert and uh, Dunn, for instance, and even Vaughn and Traherne, so he, he doesn't get editions of his poems put out very often. The one I have, I think it's from the 60s, they're hard to come by, and they're expensive if you can find them. At least they are now. But let's take a look at his Hymn and the Assumption. On the assumption of Mary, uh, one of one of the few poems in Crashaw's canon, I guess we could say, that treats uh, a a precisely Roman Catholic idea as a that, that's something that's not necessary that that is very foreign to the Anglican mindset, you know. Most of the things, even with St. Teresa, it's not that far away. I mean, he's talking about a Catholic subject, yes, but he doesn't he doesn't entertain any uh, Catholic opinions that are that are foreign from Anglican opinions. But he does hear it with the assumption to him. Now, uh, <clears throat> it's not. Well, for him, it's not, not a really long poem, which means it's a long poem. Uh, and, of course, the Assumption of Mary is when she, her, she is taken bodily into heaven. Hark, she is called. The parting hour is come. Take thy farewell, poor world. Heaven must go home. It's that, kind of the same things he was doing with the, with the Teresa poem, right? A piece of heavenly earth pure and brighter than the chaste stars whose choice lamps come to light her. While through those crystal orbs, clearer than they, she climbs, makes a far more milky way. She's called. Hark, 
How the dear immortal dove sighs to his silver mate, rise up, my love. Rise up, my love. It's a, it's a direct quote from the Song of Songs. Rise up, my love, my dove. Rise up, my fair, my spotless one. The winter's past, the rain is gone. Really just beautiful poem. The spring has come, the flowers appear. No sweets but thou are waiting, wanting here. Come away, my love. Come away, my dove. Let's see where we go again. Cast off delay, the court of heaven is come to wait upon me. Come away, come, come, come away, the flowers appear. Now, a little bit later, not just a few lines later, he drops a, a line that always intrigued me. Uh, he says, well, I'll lead up to it. Uh, the winter's past, or if he... Um, the winter's past, or if he make less haste, his answer is, why does she so? If summer come not, how can winter go? And I wonder if uh, Percy Shelley, an ode to the west wind, is riffing on this, this last line, if summer come not, how can winter go? Uh, now, you know, when, when sp I mean, the last line in Ode to the West Wind is, if, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? I wonder if there's a relationship there. And also, you'll notice in Crashaw a little bit, we're going to hit a lot more of this in, especially in Vaughn, but even also to a, to a certain degree in Traherne, is nature. You know, we just heard some figures of nature. Uh, Vaughn really is deeply aware of the natural world. And uh, so this is around line 28. The shrill winds chide, the waters weep thy stay. The fountains murmur, and each loftiest tree bows lowest his heavy top to look for thee. Um, like with St. Paul, all nature groaneth, <laughs> right? You know? And so all of nature is also groaning at the, at the departure of, of the virgin. Come away, my love, come away, my dove. She's called again, and will she go? Right. And at the very, uh, toward the end of, of this, this section, he even quotes a Catholic prayer. Hail, holy queen of humble hearts. We in thy, thy praise will have our parts. So, what ex I mean, interesting, you know, this this radical exuberance that Crashaw shows for these feminine figures, really, which, you know, especially especially the the, the gushiness he gets for the Virgin would would have made some, and, and especially his father in the Anglican Church, be a little suspicious. I'm not sure about that, right? But let's take a look. I think maybe this might be the last one we do today. We'll see. <clears throat> At the Weeper. His poem about Mary Magdalene. Again, another feminine figure. And he... It just... You gotta wonder, you know? Um, what, what the... What, you know, we can say with Goethe, right? Uh, the, the eternal feminine drives us ever onward. You can see that present here in, in, uh, in Crashaw. Uh, you know, um, and even though, I mean, you, and well, actually, we didn't, we talked a little bit about it with Herbert, but Herbert wants, you know, in, in the poem, I can't remember the title of it, it comes right after uh, the Mary Army Anagram. Uh, he would love to pray to the Virgin, but he knows he can't because the church says no. Whereas, we'll see with Vaughn, that he finally throws it down and it starts praying to the Virgin in some of his poems, you know, because he doesn't care what the Puritans think anymore. Um, okay, let's keep going. So, The Weeper. Let's start. Hail, sister springs, parents of silver-footed rills. Ever bubbling things, thawing crystals, snowy hills, 
Still spending, never spent. I mean thy fair eyes, sweet Magdalene. Interesting, right? It starts with all, all, all these images of, of na nature and water, but it's, they're not nature and water. It's the Magdalene's eyes because she's weeping. This is takes place um, when she comes to when the woman with the alabaster jar, who you know, a lot of people, you know, she was thought to be Mary Magdalene. Though I think most most uh, most theologians and uh, Bible scholars would say no, that's not who it is. But but tradition, you know, traditional understanding, certainly in the early modern period, that's Mary Magdalene. Now here again, he does another one of these chiasmic transpositions. We saw with with with, with the, the assumption poem. We see with with, with uh, you know uh, read for her for him and him for her right. Her, her, him for her and her for him and let and let her be the seraphim so same thing happens in the weeper here where he keeps saying this and it's just beautiful but it's it's stark or startling heavens thy fair eyes be heavens heavens of ever falling stars to seed time still with thee and stars thou sowest, whose harvest dares promise the earth to counter shine, whatever make makes heaven's forehead fine. So her her tears are becoming stars in heaven, and he, and he says, upwards dost thou dost weep. Heaven's bosom drinks the gentle stream. Where the milky rivers creep, thine floats above and is the cream. Waters above the heavens, what they be. We are taught best by thy tears and thee. Um, and so it's not just the, the transposition of heaven and earth, but also that, you know, and this is right, our tears reach to heaven. Her tears reach to heaven. And, but, but they change places. Right? And they don't just reach to heaven, they become part of the heavens. So there's a cosmological dimension to to all of his poems. It's not, you know, it's it's like it's expansive. It's got this big, big vision of the cosmos and of this. I mean, you gotta have to say it. He's divine feminine. You have to say that because it's it's that's where it happens for him. This is what fills up the picture for Crashaw. And oh, no, we'll move along. This is a long poem. Uh, well, this is a uh, section fifteen. O oh, cheeks, beds of chaste loves, by your own showers seasonably dashed. Eyes, nests of milky doves, in your own wells decently washed, a wit of love that thus could place fountain and garden in one face. That's almost surrealism. That almost could place fountain and garden in one face. And keep going. And it's a long poem. I don't want to, it's so long, I don't want to read the whole thing, but. Let's get to the end. And it, you, know, you can see, you can tell, it's just so emotional. You know, he's so emotionally invested in the picture he's, he's creating. And then, which invites us into it to, you know, to get swept away, actually, to get swept away by the emotion of it, not the logic of it, right? Because in mysticism, Logic only takes you so far, and then you have to go elsewhere. Now, Herbert, as we saw, would prefer to draw within and, and have an ecstatic experience of it, but, but Crashaw is the ecstatic poet par excellence. And here at the end, when the first time I read this, it just blew my mind. Last two stanzas, two sections, 33 and 31. Or 30 and 31, sorry. 
Uh, we go not to seek the darlings of Aurora's bed, the rose's modest cheek, nor the violet's humble head. Though the field's eyes too weepers be, because they want such tears as we. Much less mean we to trace the fortune of inferior, inferior gems, preferred to some pr proud face, or perched upon feared diadems, crown heads are toys. We go to meet a worthy object, our Lord's feet. Which always struck me as so clunky. Our Lord's feet. He ended with feet. Um, but that's how it ends. <laughs> But also it lands it. It lands the poem right there because this is where Mary is. This whole meditation arises from this contemplation of scripture and the woman with the alabaster jar weeping at the feet of Christ and drying her drying drying his feet with her with her hair. The way it's the weeper. And so so much so much there so much there. Um I think that might be enough to, to talk about for today. Um, Crashaw wrote, did, did a lot of translation work and wrote poems in Latin, quite, quite a few poems in Latin, some in Greek, which, you know, are, and he, his epigrams are very interesting as well. But I think, you know, what I want to leave you with is what, what sets him apart from the other poets is his Marian devotion, his, his, his relationship to the divine feminine. Uh, in his exuberance, I mean, it's a, what an interesting, interesting uh, juxtaposition from the ecstatic Herbert the ex, to the ecstatic Crashaw. Even though as, as, uh, Crashaw's one of his books that came out two years, came out in sixteen forty six, he died in sixteen forty eight. But one of his books, titles, title is "Steps to the Temple," which is in homage to George Herbert's "The Temple." He doesn't even, you know, he's not in the temple. He's just, he's just steps to the temple, you know, because he sees Herbert as the master. But what different psychological personalities. Yeah. But, but beautiful poems, nonetheless. So, so um, we'll see you next time when we talk about uh, Henry Vaughn, who, who is... Well, they're all, they're all, all these metaphysical poets are different, but he's, he's unique... In that he's a uh, he's the kind of person they said he marches to the beat of his own drummer uh, and another Welshman. So we'll talk to you then. <laughs>